board conferences now? I understand that we are holding board conferences, but the state still didn't attend. They just got out. Haven't they opened it that everybody at work can now go? They've opened up to 150 people now. Yeah. So is that what it is? Or most of my districts above that now. Brothers and sisters, thank you for attending our session tonight. We appreciate you being here. I am Brother Farron. I'll go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful this evening to be here, to be able to hear thy word and learn more about thy gospel. We're grateful for the sacrifice of thy son, Jesus Christ, for his atonement for us and ask that we might have thy spirit as we listen tonight, that we may learn, that we may be prompted to do what is right and helped to do what is right. We thank thee for the scriptures. We pray that our minds may be enlightened this evening, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we commence this evening, I need to make a correction. If you have your notes from last week, section 13 of the Doctrine and Covenants, I give you the reference doctrines of salvation, volume 3, page 199 to 202. It should be volume 3, page 99 to 102. So. If you don't mind making that correction, I'm sorry that the wrong pages were given to you. This evening, <clears throat> we'll start with section 14 of the Doctrine and Covenants. 14, 15, and 16 are revelations that were given to the Whitmer brothers. The one in section 14 given to David Whitmer by way of introduction into the life of this individual. His uh, name shows up five different times uh, in the Doctrine and Covenants, five different sections. He is the son of Peter Whitmer Sr. and Mary Musselman. He was born January 7th, 1805, which means that he's just uh, months older than the prophet himself. <clears throat> he's one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. He's also one of the six who helped organized the church on April 6th, 1830. On that occasion, the organization, he'll be ordained an elder uh, in the priesthood. He married a neighbor, Julie Ann Jolly, the Jollies, and the Whitmer's farms bordered each other. He marries on the 9th of January, 1831. They're the parents of two children. He will serve as the president of the church in Missouri, which today would be a position of stake president. However, it'll be a problem for David Whitmer because he'll later see Joseph Smith as the president of the church in Ohio and he's the president of the church in Missouri. He served also on the Kirtland High Council and by 1837, he's out of harmony with the prophet Joseph Smith. He'll be excommunicated at Far West, Missouri on April 13, 1838, and the charge was apostasy, and that's what David Whitmer is. He is an apostate. He's always true and faithful to his witness, thank goodness. But outside of that, he's disloyal to the prophet. He rejects him as a prophet. He does not believe in the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood, and there were other things. One of the charges brought against him is that he wouldn't keep the word of wisdom. And, uh, and they didn't excommunicate in that day over the word of wisdom. On one occasion, I had an opportunity to talk to Dr. Milton Backman at BYU about that, and he said, I believe what the real matter was is he rejected the revelation on the word of wisdom, which means that he rejects the prophet Joseph Smith. That made more sense to me and would appear to be what the problem was. 
He will then leave Far West. He moved to Richmond, Missouri. That's the seedbed of the anti-Mormon movement. That's where the mob in large part are coming from. And he's welcome there because he's no longer a member of the church. At Richmond, he served on the city council. And then in 1867, he will serve as the mayor of Richmond. He was prominent. He was well respected. He is the most interviewed of the three witnesses. None were ever interviewed as much as this man was. He died January 25th, 1888. He's buried at Richmond, Missouri. Lynette and I have had the opportunity. I have stood many, many times by his grave and thought about uh, uh, how lonely, in a sense, that is to be so far away from the body of the church and to be buried there. But that was his choice. Let's go now to section 14 to verse 7. Here we read, and if you keep my commandments and endure to the end, those two requirements, keep commandments, endure to the end, you shall have eternal life. Which gift is the greatest of all the gifts of God? Let me share with you uh, something here briefly from Elder McConkie, but before I do so, just to remind you of Moses chapter 1, verse 39, where the Savior said, that this is his work and glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Immortality is a gift to all mankind for uh, at least sustaining the Savior and our Father in heaven and the plan and pre-earth life. Coming through the veil of mortality, they are assured that they will become resurrected beings. And thus they will live forever as a resurrected being. But eternal life is much, much more. Elder McConkie said this, As used in the scriptures, eternal life is the name given to the kind of life that our eternal Father lives. The word eternal is used in the name eternal life is a noun and not an adjective. It is one of the formal names of deity, has been chosen by him as a particular name to identify the kind of life that he lives. He being God, the life he lives is God's life. His name, in the noun sense, being eternal, the kind of life he lives is eternal life. <clears throat> Thus, God's life is eternal life. Eternal life is God's life. The expressions are synonymous. Immortality is to live forever in the resurrected state, and by the grace of God, all men will gain this unending continuance of life. But only those who obey the fullness of the gospel law will inherit eternal life. That comes out of Mormon doctrine. Page 237, Mormon Doctrine, page 237. Thus, the brief definition of eternal life is, it is God's life. It is the life that he enjoys. Now let's come back to verse 8. It shall come to pass that if you shall ask the Father in my name, in faith, believing, you shall receive the Holy Ghost which giveth utterance, that you may stand as a witness of the things of which you shall both hear and see, also that you may declare repentance unto this generation. Let me explain the two terms, hear and see. He will be privileged to hear the voice of the Son of God himself speak from the eternities. He also will see Moroni, and when he does, Moroni will speak to him, in fact, David Whitmer is the only one that Moroni spoke to that we know of. And he said to him, David, blessed is the Lord, and he that keeps his commandments. As you look in historical retrospect, you can see why he said that. All three of the witnesses will be excommunicated. Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris come back. David Whitmer does not come back. He dies out of the kingdom of God. He's also promised that he would see. He sees a resurrected being, a glorified being, Moroni. He will see the plates and numerous other things, which we'll list when we get in section 17. Now verse 9. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, which means this, that our Father in heaven as is an eternal resurrected being, 
And so uh, that is the great testimony there of the Son of God himself. Verse 10, Wherefore I must bring forth the fullness of my gospel. The fullness of his gospel is the doctrine and the saving ordinances from the Gentiles unto the house of Israel. Great promises then to David Whitmer. Would that he would have stayed faithful. Let's come to John section 15 and now to John Whitmer. John Whitmer is mentioned in six different sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. He is older than David Whitmer. In fact, he's the third son of Peter and Mary Whitmer. He's born 27th of August, 1802, near near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. In June 1829, he'll be baptized and later ordained an elder. He became one of the eight witnesses in this dispensation. He will serve for a period of time as church historian. I'll mention that more fully uh, just a little bit later. He will serve as a counselor to his brother David Whitmer in the presidency of the church at Far West Missouri. And so he, being older, will serve as a counselor to a younger brother. He also was excommunicated on March 10th, 1838. He never came back. He will be a farmer and a stock raiser at Far West. He held a lot of holdings. He'll have 625 acres in that area, which included he owned the temple lot and where the main part of the city was. His home stood there, a two-story home, clear into... uh, the 1900s. In fact, the church was offered uh, by some of the descendants uh, the home. If we wanted it, we chose not to buy it. It no longer is there. It's, it's now gone. He's the father of three sons and one daughter. One of his sons was killed in the Civil War. He died July 11th, 1878. He's buried in the Kingston Cemetery and uh, that's uh, not too many miles from far west. That's the county seat now, and uh, that's where the courthouse is, is over in uh, Kingston. Let's come now to uh, verse 6. Now behold, I say unto you that the thing which will be the most worth unto you will be to declare repentance unto this people, that you may bring souls unto me, that you may rest with them in the kingdom of my my father. I'm going to define that for you here, and then from now on I'll only give you the reference. We want to define what it means that you may rest with them in the kingdom of my father. To do that, we turn to Doctrine and Covenants, section 84. This is one of the references that you want to learn because it's used in multiple places in the scriptures, verse 24, section 84 reads, But they hardened their hearts, could not endure his presence. Therefore the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory. That's what this man, John Whitmer's promise there in verse 8 To enter into the rest of the Lord is to receive a fullness of his glory or eternal life. So by verse 6, I would note Doctrine and Covenants 84, verse 24. From now on, as we hit that terminology, we'll only give you the reference. Let's go now to section 16. Section 16 is the same as 15. So we'll just mention Peter Whitmer, Jr., He's mentioned in two of the sections. He'll come up again. He also is the son of Peter and Mary Whitmer. He is the youngest. He's born the 27th of September, 1809. He's baptized by Oliver Cowdery in uh, June, 1829. He'll be the one called to go with Oliver Cowdery on the mission to the Lamanites. He learned the trade of a tailor, which will become important later on. He eventually will die about two miles from Liberty, Missouri, 22nd of September, 1836, where he was buried by his oldest brother, Christian Whitmer. Christian Whitmer and Peter Whitmer, Jr. died active, faithful members of the church. Peter Whitmer left a wife and three daughters. One of them was born 
after he had died. He also is one of the eight witnesses. Let's now go to section 17 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Here we begin to read about the law of witnesses. And to introduce this, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul. He said, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So that's the law of God, that everything that he does is established by witness, at least two to three witnesses. In the case of those plates, we have 12 witnesses. We have the three, we have the eight, we have Joseph Smith. Mary Musselman Whitmer will see the plates, but she is not a witness of the plates. She is not bound to testify to the world the way the other 12 were. So even though sometimes I hear it said she's a 13th witness, that is really not true. She is granted a special witness, but she does not stand as a witness of this great work in the same sense these other men do. Let's go now to the book of Ether, chapter 5, where Moroni will counsel the future translator, Joseph Smith, on how he will know uh, who the witnesses are. I'm going to go to chapter 5 and start with verse 2. We read, And behold, ye, Joseph Smith, may be privileged that ye, Joseph, may show the plates unto those who shall assist to bring forth this work. No, there is one way he'll know them. They will assist to help him bring forth this work. And unto three shall they be shown by the power of God. Wherefore, they shall know of a surety that these things are true. And in the mouth of three witnesses shall these things be established. In the testimony of three in this work, in the which shall be shown forth the power of God, also his word of which the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost bear record. And all this shall stand as a testimony against the world at the last day. There's the direction from Moroni when he was a mortal prophet upon the earth to the future translator, that there will be three men called as special witnesses. Joseph Smith will know who they are because they will assist to help bring forth the work. It's interesting that the Spirit of the Lord also worked on the three men, Oliver, Martin, and David, and they came and asked Joseph if they could be the witnesses, to which the prophet granted that he also knew that that's who was to be the witnesses. They will receive their special witness a short distance from the Whitmer home, where the prophet took them into a wooded area. Without reviewing too much of the historical, all four men knelt in prayer, they prayed in turn, nothing happened. When Martin Harris said that it was because of him, he knew it was, and he got up and left and he went some distance. The prophet said they no sooner knelt down in prayer than Moroni appeared. Joseph then later will go and find Martin at some distance. And when he told him what had happened, Martin said, Oh, pray for me, Joseph, that I can see. They knelt in prayer, and I guess Martin was now humbled enough that the same thing the other two saw, he now saw. So he was separate from the other two when Moroni appeared to him. Now, let's take a look, starting with verse 1, where there will be a list of what it is they'll see, plus I'm going to add to it from another source. Behold, I say unto you that you must rely upon my word, which if you do with full purpose of heart, you shall have a view of the plates, that's the small plates, and the plates of Mormon, the abridgment. Also of the breastplate, the sword of Laban, the Urim and the Thunum, which were given to the brother of Jared upon the mount. That's interesting that the Urim and Thunum that the prophet had was the interpreters that had been given to the brother of Jared. They had been preserved and watched over that they could be used in the translation of these plates. When he talked to the Lord face to face and the miraculous directors which were given to Lehi while in the wilderness on the borders of the Red Sea, that will become known as the Lehona. 
I would know it by the sword of Laban in the verse, 1 Nephi chapter 4, verse 9. 1 Nephi 4, verse 9, where it gives a description of the sword. By the Urim and Thunim, I would put Ether, chapter 3, verse 28. Ether 3, verse 28, where it speaks of the interpreters. With the miraculous directors, I would put 1 Nephi 16:10. 1 Nephi 16.10, where it gives a description. And then I'd put Alma 17.38, Alma 17.38, where we learned that they, Lehi called it the uh, Leohona. Now, on September 11, 1878, Orson Pratt and Joseph S. Smith visited David Whitmer in Richmond, Missouri, where they talked to him about his sacred experience hearing the voice of God as well as seeing the plates. David Whitmer added the following, and then I'll give you the source for it in a minute. He said that Moroni had a table, and on the table were the items mentioned in verse 1, plus he adds this. He said the brass plates were on the table, the plates of the book of Ether was on the table and many other plates, but he does not say what they were. And so they saw many things that day as Moroni made his appearance. The source for that is the life of Joseph F. Smith, page 242 and 243, written by his son Joseph Fielding Smith. Life of Joseph F. Smith, page 242-243. That is a good book and well worth your time to read. You'll gain great knowledge of the history of our church and of this noble prophet if you study that verse or that reference. Verse 2. It is by your faith you shall obtain a view of them, even by that faith which was had by the prophets of old. That's a requirement that the Lord lists. This revelation, by the way, was given just prior to their experience. And after that you have obtained faith and have seen them with your eyes. You shall testify of them by the power of God, which means they are to testify by the power of the Holy Ghost. Which witness is sure? Which witness is binding on those who hear? That is the most powerful witness there is to testify by the power of the Holy Ghost. That is how missionaries teach in the mission field is by the power of the Holy Ghost. And they bear witness that Joseph Smith is a prophet. The Book of Mormon is true. And those who are receptive feel that power and become part of the work. Now verse 4. And this you shall do, that my servant Joseph Smith, Jr. may not be destroyed, that I may bring about my righteous purposes unto the children of men in this work. Ye shall testify that you have seen them, even as my servant Joseph Smith, Jr. has seen them. For it is by my power that he has seen them, and it is because he had faith. He has translated the book, even that part which I have commanded, him and as your Lord and your God liveth, it is true. Again, I turn to Elder McConkie for commentary on that phrase, as your Lord and your God liveth, it is true. He said this, one of the most solemn oaths ever given to man is found in these words of the Lord relative to Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon. This is God's testimony of the Book of Mormon. In it, deity himself has laid his godhood on the line. Either the book is true or God ceases to be God. There neither is nor can be any more formal or powerful language known to men or gods. That's how strong that statement is. That comes from Conference Report, April 1982, page 50. Conference Report, April 1982, page 50. Let's turn now in connection with that to one other reference. This one's the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, and it's chapter 6, Hebrews 6, verse 13. Paul said, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Same language, only now the testimony of a great apostle 
whose name is Paul. If one understands that phrase, then we understand why Joseph Smith explained and said this. He said, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth, the keystone of our religion. A man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. That comes out of the History of the Church, Volume 4, page 46. History of the Church, Volume 4, page 46. Uh, verse 8, if you do these last commandments of mine, which I have given you, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. That means the gates are closed. For my grace is sufficient for you. Grace, the best scripture on that is 2 Nephi 25, verse 23. 2 Nephi 25, 23. And you shall be lifted up at the last day, which is a reference to the second coming. It's a reference to the final judgment. It's a reference to exaltation in the celestial kingdom of our God. The three witnesses heard the voice of the Savior when they had their sacred experience. That comes out of the history of the church, volume 1, page 54 and 55. That brings us to section 18 of the Doctrine and Covenants. As far as historical background goes, I note the following. The prophet said we continued faithful. We should also, uh, provided that we should also have the Melchizedek priesthood. We had for some time made this matter a subject of humble prayer. And at length we got together in the chamber of Mr. Whitmer's, that's Peter Whitmer Sr.'s house. For we had not long been engaged in solemn and fervent prayer when the word of the Lord came unto us in the chamber, commanding us that I should ordain Oliver Cowdery to be an elder in the church of Jesus Christ, that he should also ordain me. The Lord went on and told him that that was not to take place until the organization of the church. Doctrine and Covenant section 128 verse 21 deals with that. And with that uh, particular quote, I'd note History of the Church, Volume 1, page 60 and 61. Volume 1, 60, 61. And then DNC 128, verse 21. Now, let's look at some of these verses. We'll start with verse 1. Oliver desired special instructions concerning the building up of the church. The Savior said, Now behold, because of the thing which you, my servant Oliver Cowdery, have desired to know of me, I give unto you these words. Behold, I have manifested unto you by my Spirit in many instances that the things which you have written are true, wherefore you know that they are true. Oliver Cowdery describes these events thus. He said this, These were days never to be forgotten. To sit under the sound of a voice dictated by the inspiration of heaven, awaken the utmost gratitude of this bosom. Day after day I continued uninterrupted to write from his mouth as he translated with the Urim and the Thunum, or as the Nephites would have said, interpreters, the history or record called the Book of Mormon. That's found in the Pearl of Great Price on page 58. Pearl of Great Price, page 58. Note another reference where Oliver Cowdery said, day after day, the plates were translated by the Urim and the Thunum. He never uh, deviated or changed from that. Verse 3, and if you know that they are true, behold, I give unto you a commandment, that you rely upon the things which are written, which is the teachings of the Book of Mormon. For in them, the Book of Mormon, are all things written concerning the foundation of my church, my gospel, and my rock. Wherefore, if you shall build up my church upon the foundation of my gospel and my rock, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. That's another promise. Behold, the world is ripening in iniquity. And thus needs be the children of men are stirred up under repentance, both Gentiles and and also the house of Israel. Verse 6 explains the purpose of the restoration. 
That's how that verse is so important to us. It explains the purpose of the restoration. Verse 8. Now marvel not that I have called him Joseph Smith unto mine own purposes, which purpose is known in me. Wherefore, if he shall be diligent in keeping my commandments, he shall be blessed unto eternal, unto eternal life. His name is Joseph. Let's go now for a minute to the book of Genesis, where we gain a great insight into the meaning of that name. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 30. Genesis 30, verse 24. And she, Rachel, called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. But now come down to the footnote, 24a, where we read, Joseph relates both to the Hebrew root, Yosef, to add and to a safe meaning both to take away and together. The context plies upon all of these meanings. In other words, this is what it means. The scriptures foretell the coming of a great one. And his name then means he who gathers and causes to return. The meaning of the name of Joseph describes his divine mission. Let's go off now for just a minute to Second Nephi chapter 3. And this is the teachings of Joseph sold into Egypt, a prophecy that he made concerning the Latter-day Seer. We have time only to look at a couple of the verses. So we'll start with verse 6, 2 Nephi 3. For Joseph truly testified, saying, A seer shall the Lord my God raise up, who shall be a choice seer under the fruit of mine loins. Choice means special or exceptional. Yea, Joseph truly said, Thus saith the Lord unto me, A choice seer will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins, and he shall be esteemed highly among the fruit of thy loins. Okay, the name Joseph then, most significant. Genesis 30, verse 24, the footnote A helps get the insight that we need as to why that name is so important and why Joseph Smith has that name. Now, let's go to verse 9. And now, Oliver Cowdery, I speak unto you, and also unto David Whitmer, by the way of commandment. Behold, I command all men everywhere to repent. I speak unto you, even, unto, even as unto Paul mine apostle, for your call, even of that same calling with which he was called. Joseph Fielding Smith explained the verse this way. He said in section 18, verse 9, a revelation given in 1829, nearly a year before the church was organized. The Lord declares that Oliver Cowdery was called with the same calling as was Paul, which was the Melchizedek priesthood, as an especial witness of his name. All three witnesses were uh, apostles. H here are the references. First, Brigham Young, who said this, Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer were the first apostles in this dispensation. That's Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, page 320. Volume 6, 320. Heber C. Kimball, counselor in the First Presidency, said this. Peter comes along with James and John and ordains Joseph to be an apostle. Then Joseph ordains Oliver and David Whitmer and Martin Harris. And they were ordered to select 12 more and ordain them. That's volume 6 of the Journal of Discourses, page 29. So we learn from Brigham Young and from Heber C. Kimball that all three witnesses were apostles. Now, they were never put in the Quorum of the Twelve, but that is not unique. We have had many in our dispensation who have been ordained apostles and were never put in the Twelve. Daniel H. Wells, Joseph Young, John Young, Alvin R. Dyer, Jacob Hamblin, all of those were ordained apostles, never put in the Quorum of the Twelve. Let's come down now to verse 10. Remember the souls, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God, 
And now he explains just how great they are and how much they are worth. Here he explains, For behold, the Lord, your Redeemer, suffered death in the flesh. Wherefore he suffered the pain of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. He hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. That's how great the worth of souls are that a God would suffer beyond anything we can imagine, that salvation could come to our Father in Heaven's other children. In verse 13 through 16, we are called to help to bring about the salvation of our fellow man. We read, And how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth. Wherefore, you are called to cry repentance unto this people. And if it so be, you should labor all your days, crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be, one soul unto me. How great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. I've heard it said that the one soul there deals with us as an individual. That is not true. The word bring means two or more. And uh, he's not talking just about us. He's talking about us as an individual helping to bring at least one other one. I think of men like Zebedee Coltrane, who gives 16 years of his life as a full-time missionary. I think of Joseph Wilford Booth, who will die eventually in uh, Aleppo in Syria after having been away for many years in the Middle East. I think of Jabez Woodard, who helped open Italy, a missionary in England. His family was in St. George before he could go down and live with them. President Young asked him to go to a community in northern Utah where they were struggling spiritually and to help them and to spend the winter there. And uh, he will stay in the home of the Thurston family here in Melton. And here he died. He's buried in the Melton Cemetery away from his family and his loved ones. When you see all of those men one day in the paradise, ask them if it was worth it. See what they have to say no at now because they were so faithful. Let's come to verse 20. The Savior says, contend against no church, save it be the church of the devil, which means to contend against evil. We are not sent to condemn Catholics, Jehovah Witness, Baptists, or anyone else. Our enemy is Satan and those that uphold him that are evil. And that's the only ones that we contend with. Verse 21. Take upon you the name of Christ. Speak the truth in soberness. Soberness means to be serious-minded. And as many as repent are baptized in my name, in my name means priesthood authority, which is Jesus Christ, and door to the end, the same shall be saved. So in verse 22, he lists the requirements to be saved. That verse 22 is repeated in multiple places in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, Jesus Christ is the name which is given of the Father. There is none other name given whereby man can be saved. I would note by those verses the following. Moses 6, verse 52. Moses 6, 52. Mosiah 5, 6 through 8. Mosiah 5, 6 through 8, which I think you would find are helpful. Wherefore, 24, wherefore all men must take upon them the name which is given of the Father, for in that name shall they be called at the last day. Wherefore, if they know not the name by which they are called, they cannot have place in the kingdom of my Father. The meaning of that verse is far deeper than what we might think. It's not just a matter of saying, I was baptized and I am a Christian. It means that we know the individual who has that name, that we have come to know Jesus the Christ. John chapter 5 verse 39 tells us how to do that. We must search the scriptures. We must turn to the Savior's special witnesses, and we listen closely to what they teach and have to say about the Son of God. And in due time, we also will come to know him. Our love for him will grow stronger. Our desire to obey the Savior will increase, as it were, on a daily basis. We must know him 
the person whose name we bear. Now verse 26 through 38 is instructions to David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery to begin preparation to call the Quorum of the Twelve. Now, this becomes to me very, very significant because it lists only those two men. It lists David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery. Later, Joseph Smith added Martin Harris. Why is that so important? Because of Matthew uh, 13, verse 33, where it speaks of the parable of the leaven, which I explained to you when we did section 5. Joseph Smith is, was not smart enough to get all of this right all of the time. He is an inspired prophet, and by revelation, he got it all right and helped us to understand. So be aware that only two are listed there who are to begin to prepare to call the 12, but a third is added, and that helps to fulfill Matthew 13, 33. So let's look at the requirements. 26, and now behold, there are others who are called to declare my gospel, both unto Gentile and unto Jew, yea, even 12. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, they will be called on February 14th, 1835, in a building that sat, uh, I have to think here for just a minute in my direction, that sat just to the west, behind the Kirkland Temple. There was a two-story building that was built there. And Joseph Smith gathered all those who had marched in Zion's camp. And after prayer, and Joseph set the three witnesses apart and blessed them, they began to call the men out of the audience who were to sit in the quorum of the 12 apostles. They lined them up in seniority by age. The oldest was 35. The youngest, the last four, were 23. So your first quorum of 12 ranged in age from 35 to 23. Let's come back now to what the Savior has to say. The 12 shall be my disciples. This, the word disciple means follower and it means pupil. And in the Book of Mormon, that's the terminology used with the 12 is the word disciple. They shall take upon them my name and the 12 are they who shall, here's where he starts to list qualifications. One shall desire to take upon them my name with full purpose of heart. Verse 28, one, two, third line, here's number two. They are called to go into all the world to preach my gospel unto every creature. 29, number three. They are they who are ordained of me to baptize in my name according to that which is uh, written. Come down, 31. Now I speak unto you, the twelve, behold, my grace is sufficient for you. Number four, you must walk uprightly before me and sin not. To walk uprightly is to be honorable. Thirty-two, and behold, number five, you are they who are ordained of me to ordain priests and teachers. And six, to declare my gospel. Come over now to verse 36. Wherefore, you can testify that you have heard my voice and know my words. Now behold, I give unto you Oliver Cowdery, also unto David Whitmer. Ye shall search out the twelve, who shall have the desires of which I have spoken. Here's how they'll know who they are. The Lord gives a clue. They will know who they are by two ways, 38. And number one, by their desires. And number two, their works. You shall know them. For six years, they will study, observe, and watch the brethren in the church so that on February 14, 1835, they now are in a position to call the members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Let's come over now to section 19 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is a powerful section in here with great truths that's been revealed to all of us. As far as historical background, I turned to Joseph Hilding Smith, and he said this. It would seem that Martin Harris had come to Joseph Smith seeking further assurance in relation to his standing before the Lord. Being sorely troubled in his spirit because of his transgression, he had already been granted the privilege on his earnest solicitation of being one of the three witnesses, and that wonderful vision had been given 
Perhaps out of this came much serious reflection, and he sought further light. However, there is no indication in the history of the church as to the reason why the revelation was given. The exact day is unknown when it was given. It was without question a revelation of great comfort to Martin. It is one of the great revelations given in this dispensation. There are few of greater import than this. The doctrine of the atonement of the Lord is directly applying to the individual. His exposition of eternal punishment, as here set forth, give to the members of the church light which was not previously known. That's Joseph Hilding Smith, Church History, Modern Revelation, Volume 1, page 8081. Church History, Modern Revelation, Volume 1, page 8081. Verse 1, I am Alpha and Omega, Christ the Lord. Yea, even I am He, the beginning and the end, the Redeemer of the world. I have accomplished and finished the will of him whose I am. That has reference to the atonement. Concern, even the Father concerning me, having done this, I might subdue all things unto myself, retaining all power, even to the destroying of Satan. That is explained in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When I give uh, the lesson on the Savior, I cover Genesis 3:15. So you might want to just look at those notes. And his works at the end of the world. And I might mention here, brothers and sisters, the Savior has won. Satan has lost. The atonement is in place. The only thing not decided is how many of us are going to receive full benefit of the atonement through sincere repentance and our obedience. And so the Lord allows the earth to continue and mankind to keep coming to the earth to fulfill his purposes, but you and I should be wise enough to know that it is over in the sense that victory went to the Lord as he worked out that atonement process. He says, uh, in the last great day of judgment, which I shall pass upon the inhabitants thereof, judging every man according to his works and the deeds which he hath done, and surely every man must repent or suffer, for I, God, am endless. The law of justice which God himself put in place demands payment. The law of justice demands fairness, that every human being is treated fairly. The Savior satisfied the demands of justice. He made full payment. He now stands between that law and us. If we repent, keep the commandments, he gives us mercy. If we refuse to repent or won't repent and keep commandments, he steps out. The law of justice comes down. And he's going to give us a glimpse here in a minute of how bad that is, and you and I don't want to have anything to do with that. The law of justice demands payment. And without that, God would cease to be God, and he is never going to cease to be God. Let's come to verse 9. I speak unto you that are chosen in this thing, even as one, that you may enter into my rest. D&C 84, verse 24. 84, 24. Now he speaks of eternal punishment in 10 through 12. For behold, the mystery of godliness, how great is it? For behold, I am endless. The punishment which is given from my hand is endless punishment. For endless is my name. Wherefore, eternal punishment's God's punishment. Endless punishment's God's punishment. Elder James E. Talmadge explains that, I think, in as clear a way as I have read. He said this, Hell is no place to which a vindictive judge sends prisoners to suffer and to be punished principally for his glory. But it is a place prepared for the teaching, the disciplining of those who fail to learn here upon the earth what they should have learned. True, we read of everlasting punishment, unending suffering, eternal damnation. That is a direful expression, but in his mercy the Lord has made plain what those words mean. Eternal punishment, he says, is God's punishment for he is eternal, and that condition or state or possibility will ever exist for the sinner 
who deserves and really needs such condemnation. But this does not mean that the individual sufferer or sinner is to be eternally and everlastingly made to endure and suffer. No man will be kept in hell longer than is necessary to bring him to a fitness for something better. That's a beautiful expression. When he reaches that stage, the prison doors will open. There will be rejoicing among the hosts who welcome him into a better state. It comes out of the conference reports, April 1930, page 97. Conference report, April 1930, page 97. That is one of the most helpful doctrinal statements by a member of the Twelve that I think I have ever read on those verses. Now, verse 15 through 20, the Savior reports on his suffering. Let me preface it with a reminder to you. Verse 15 through 20 is not something that the world has. They don't have this revelation. The Christian world does not have this revelation. This revelation is directed to the members of the Son of God's church, to you and to I, and it contains a warning to us. So with that much in mind, let's take a look at it. Verse 15. Therefore, I command you to repent. Repent lest I smite you by the rod of my mouth and by my wrath and by my anger and your sufferings be sore. Heber C. Kimball said this, if you permit that tabernacle to become polluted and if your spirit suffers your body to be contaminated with sin and corruption, you will have to make an atonement for it before you can get your redemption worked out. It comes out of the Journal of Discourses, Volume 1, page 34. Journal of Discourses, Volume 134. Now note the words that he uses here. How sore you know not. Sore means pain or distress. He says, uh, how exquisite you know not. Exquisite denotes elaborate execution of something, the perfection of something. Whatever this is, it cleanses. We see men who are put in the penitentiaries. They come out and they continue to do bad things. Our penitentiaries do not cleanse uh, people as a whole. Whatever this process is, when you come out the other end, you'll come out clean. He says, you know not. Yea, how hard to bear, you know not. Hard means difficult. Now, who in their right mind in this church wants to find out exactly what that means? Repentance is difficult. We understand it because we've all had to repent. But the alternative is not something you want to get involved in. If the law of justice comes down on you, you'll find out what all of that means in verse 15. He says, For behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer, here it is, if they would repent. There's the condition. Repentance brings mercy. Failure to repent brings justice. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I. And uh, I just know the following. This comes from President Irene. I'll give you the reference in a minute. He said, I felt the overwhelming suffering of the Savior. And then two things dawned on me. First, if I could not repent to qualify for his atonement for my sins, I must suffer to the limit of my power to suffer. And second, with all the requisite suffering of my own, with all I could bear, it would still not be enough. I would still be forever shut out of the only place where there will be warmth of the family, the family of my Heavenly Father, whom I have loved and whom I miss, and that of my family here. Somehow I'd gotten the idea that the choice was between repenting or not. Then I realized that whatever pain repentance might bring in this life, it was certainly no more than the pain I would face if I did not repent here. And yet that later pain could not lift me home. So even after individuals have suffered to the extent that they can, it still is not enough. The Savior still will have to finish the process for them to come into a kingdom of glory. That quote comes out of the book, To Draw Closer to God, page 48 and 49. To Draw Closer to God, page 48 and page 49. Now verse 18. 
he says, which suffering caused myself, even God. And brothers and sisters, the emphasis there is on God. This is a God that is suffering. The greatest of all to one, tremble because of pain. Three, bleed at every pore. Elder Talmage and Jesus the Christ said that cannot be done. No mortal can do that. He said the pain would become so intense you would black out from it and relief would come. And three, to suffer both body and spirit. So it's not just the flesh that's in pain, but the spirit itself is suffering. And would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Now listen to the testimony of Elder Maxwell. He says, later in Gethsemane, the suffering Jesus began uh, to be sore amazed, or in the Greek, awestruck and astonished. Imagine, Jehovah, the creator of this and other worlds, astonished. Jesus knew cognitively what he must do, but not experientially. He had never personally known the exquisite and exacting process of an atonement before. Thus, when the agony came in its fullness, it was so much, much worse than even he with his unique intellect had ever imagined. No wonder an angel appeared to strengthen him. The cumulative weight of all mortal sins, past, present, and future, pressed upon that perfect, sinless, and sensitive soul. All our infirmities and sicknesses were somehow, too, a part of the awful arithmetic of the atonement. The anguish Jesus not only uh, not only pled with the Father that the iron cup might pass from him, but with this revelant citation, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Jesus' request was not theater. In this extreme, and he did he perchance hope for a rescuing ram in the thicket. I do not know. His suffering, as it were, enormity multiplied by infinity evoked his later soul cry on the cross, and it was a cry of forsakenness. Even so, Jesus maintained the sublime submissiveness that he had in Gethsemane, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. While bearing our sins, our infirmities, our sicknesses, and bringing to pass the atonement, Jesus became the perfect shepherd, making these lines of Paul's especially irrelevant and reassuring. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? Indeed, we are in his hands, and what hallowed hands. The wondrous and glorious atonement was the central act in all of human history. It was the hinge on which all else that finally matters turned, but it turned upon Jesus' spiritual submissiveness. It comes out of the conference reports, April 1985, page 92 and 93. Conference report, April 1985, page 92 and 93. He says, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Shrink means to pull back. Nevertheless, that word denotes deep divine determination he will not get up and walk out of that garden until he's completed that part of the atonement process. Glory be to the Father, and I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. Wherefore, I command you again to repent, lest I humble you with my almighty power, that you confess your sins, lest you suffer these punishments, of which I have spoken, of which in the smallest, yea, even the least degree, you have tasted the time I withdrew my spirit. Now, every member of the church can relate to that verse. All of us have done things we shouldn't, and we felt the Holy Ghost withdraw. It's a very painful experience, and we become depressed and concerned and worried uh, that God no longer loves us or wants us. And boy, does Satan ever come and cause problems. Verse 23, learn of me a process. Listen to my words means to obey. Walk in the meekness of my spirit means to be humble. You shall have peace in me. That's the greatest promise that can be given to mortal man. DNC section 59, verse 23. DNC 59, verse 23. He said, I am Jesus Christ. I came by the will of the Father, and I do his will which means he has always been obedient, always. 
Again I command thee that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor seek thy neighbor's life. For example, King David was guilty of that. Second Samuel chapter 11, chapter 12. King David, Second Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. Let's come now to uh, verse 26. He says, again, I command thee, thou shalt not covet thine own property, but impart it freely to the printing of the Book of Mormon. And bless his heart, boy, what a challenge this would have been. Verse 34, impart a portion of thy property, yea, even part of thy lands, and all save the support of thy family. Pay the debt thou hast contracted with the printer. Release thyself from bondage. That would not have been a very easy thing for him to have to do. He has contracted all 240 acres to make payment for the book of uh, the publishing of the Book of Mormon. He felt that the book would sell and that he would never have to sell his land, but it turned out that wasn't the case. They took up uh, a paper that they signed in the Palmyre area that everybody agreed they would not buy the Book of Mormon. And even uh, when the first ones began to come out, Martin was discouraged because nobody would buy one. Finally, Thomas Lakey, a wealthy businessman there, he owned part of the original General John Swift's property. He's got two shops, a blacksmith shop, made wagon sleighs. He's fairly well off. He contracts to buy the land. And Martin Harris will end up selling to him 151 acres. The rest of the property will go to his wife, uh, Lucy. But it's not completed. Interesting enough, uh, the final payment to E.B. Grandin is not completed till January 28, 1832, before this is finally finished and completed. I'll tell you a good book that's got... Uh, the information, and this is a good book. This one is worth owning. It's entitled Martin Harris and Compromising Witness of the Book of Mormon. Martin Harris and Compromising Witness of the Book of Mormon. It was done by Susan Black and Larry Porter. And I mentioned to you earlier in another lecture that, in my opinion, Larry Porter is one of the greatest historians that we have in the church today. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. Let's come to verse 37. The Savior said unto the tenants, tenants is belief or doctrines, thou shalt not talk. Thou shalt declare repentance and faith on the Savior, remission of sins by baptism, and by fire, yea, even the Holy Ghost. And so what is it that he is to teach? He is to teach the first principles of the gospel, in 32, we learn that he is to teach the first principles and to bear witness to the Book of Mormon. That is his assignment from the Savior. Let's go now to section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 20 is known as the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ. It was once known as the Constitution of the Restored Church. It was read, uh, they read this section at every conference that was held. Let's start with verse uh, 1. It says, The rise of the Church of Christ in these last days, being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the flesh, it being regularly organized and established agreeable to the laws of our country, by the will and commandments of God in the fourth month and on the sixth day of the month, which is called April. President Harold B. Lee, as president of the church, said this. This is the annual conference of the church. April 6, 1973 is a particularly significant date because it commemorates not only the anniversary of the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints in this dispensation, but also the anniversary of the birth of the Savior, our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. That's Conference Report, April 1973, page 4. Conference Report, April 1973, page 4. President Kimball also, when he said this, was the president of the church. 
He said, my brothers and sisters and friends, another April has come and with it the birthday to the church, organized on the birthday of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which we have celebrated on the 6th of April. This weekend we conduct the 144th conference and so forth. Now, we know then the day and the month the Savior was born, the year is questionable. There is a problem uh, with the year, we just have to be patient on that and one day perhaps we'll know more about it. Now note the church was to be organized agreeable to the laws of the land. The state of New York required to organize a church you had to have a minimum of three people and a maximum of nine. Joseph Smith chose to go in the middle of that and had six. Here's their names and their ages. Joseph Smith was 24. Oliver Cowdery was 23. Hiram Smith was 29. Samuel Smith, 22. Peter Whitmer, Jr., 20. David Whitmer, 25. That's the six who organized the church, the Savior's birthday, April 6th. The year of the organization is 1830. It was on a Tuesday, organized at Peter Whitmer Sr.'s home. Verse 2, which commandments were given to Joseph Smith Jr., who was called of God and ordained an apostle of Jesus Christ to be the first elder of this church. He will be sustained as the first elder at the day of the organization of the church. Three altar cadres to be the second elder. In a minute, I'll define the word elder for you. Verse 5, after it was truly manifest unto this first elder that he had received a remission of his sins. That happened in 1820 in the spring, in the first vision when the Savior told him that he had been forgiven. He was entangled again in the vanities of the world. That's 1820 to 1823. When he said that he uh, was guilty of levity and being in jovial company, and he said, no one ever need think me of great sin, for it was never in my nature to commit such. But after repenting and humbling himself sincerely through faith, God ministered unto him by a holy angel named Moroni, whose countenance was as lightning, whose garments were pure and white above all other whiteness, which is the robes of sanctification gave unto him commandments which inspired him, that's 1823 to 1827, when Moroni directly worked with the prophet Joseph. There's a little book called Moroni by Donnell Peterson, and he lists, uh, Moroni appeared to him over 20 times during those four years. Nine, which contains a record of a fallen people, a fallen people, two groups, the Jaredites and the Nephites, and thus it becomes a warning to a third group, which is us, that we can fall also if we don't keep God's commandments. And the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, to the Jews also, which was given by inspiration, was confirmed to others by the ministering of angels, as declared unto the world by them, the three witnesses. The Book of Mormon, uh, is given to prove three things. Here they are. Verse 11, proving to the world that one, the Holy Scriptures are true. That's direct reference to the Bible. The Book of Mormon unlocks the Bible. And that two, God does inspire men. Verse 12, thereby showing that he is, number three, the same God yesterday, today, and forever. The Book of Mormon then does those three things. 13, therefore having so great witnesses by them, by the scriptures and by the witnesses, shall the world be judged, even as many shall hereafter come to a knowledge of this work. Those who receive it, it is the gospel. In faith, work righteousness shall receive a crown of eternal life. DNC 14.7, the greatest gift God can give. But those who harden their hearts in unbelief, reject it, it shall turn to their own condemnation. For the Lord God has spoken it, and we, the elders of the church, have heard uh, and bear witness to the words of the glorious majesty on high. Elders there is Joseph Smith 
and Oliver Cowdery. Now, starting with verse 17 through 36, list the doctrines that we now know because of the Book of Mormon. So I'll point them out fairly quick to you. By these things, these things is the first vision and the Book of Mormon. We know, here it comes, there is a God in heaven. Miss a couple of lines. He is the framer of heaven and earth and all things which are in them. 18, he created man. 19, gave them commandments. They should love and serve him, the only living and true God. He should be the only being whom they should worship. 20, but by the transgression of these holy laws, man became sensual, became fallen man. Book of Mormon helps us to understand the fall. 21, wherefore the Almighty God gave his only begotten Son, the atonement. The Book of Mormon has more to say on the atonement of Christ than the Bible does. And most significant passages, 2 Nephi 9, Alma 7, Alma 34, and others. 22, he suffered temptations, he gave no heed. In other words, he led a perfect life. 23, he was crucified, died, and rose again. The Book of Mormon helps with that and with his resurrection and appearance to the Nephites. 25, that as many as would believe, that's faith in his gospel, be baptized in his holy name. His holy name is priesthood authority and endure in faith to the end should be saved. The Book of Mormon teaches and helps with those things. 27, as well as those who should come after, who should believe in the gifts and callings of God by the Holy Ghost, which beareth record of the Father and the Son, which Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one God. Now, with that one, the Book of Mormon is, is far more helpful than any place else, but it also will require much effort on members of this church part to, to understand that, particularly Mosiah chapter 15. If ever there was a chapter to work on and understand it is that one. So verse 28, then the Book of Mormon will speak of the Godhead and the unity of the Godhead. 29, we know that all men must repent, believe on the name of Jesus Christ, endure in faith to be saved, and so forth. 30, we know that justification through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true has a great deal to say about the law of justice, the law of mercy. 31, we know also that sanctification through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true. 34, yea, and even let those who are sanctified take heed. In other words, the Book of Mormon will warn that even those who are sanctified can fall if they do not continue to keep God's commandments and live as they should. Now, I know that I did that fairly quick. Verse 37 is the verse that full-time missionaries must comply with to baptize somebody into the church. And again, by way of commandment to the church concerning the manner of baptism, all those who, number one, humble themselves before God, two, desire to be baptized, three, come forth with broken hearts, Four, contrite spirits. That means they're penitent for sin. Five, witness before the church. How do they witness? They come to church. That's how they witness that they want to be part of this great work. They come to church so that they can grow and learn. They have truly repented all their sins and are six, willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ. Having number seven, determination to serve him to uh, the end. And number eight, truly manifest by their works, they received the spirit of Christ and the remission of their sins shall be received by baptism into his church. That is a key verse. All missionaries are to know that verse and they are to comply with it as they teach and bring people into the church. Now verse 38, the duty of the elders. He's going to begin to list the responsibilities of priesthood holders. I want to share something with you concerning uh, the elders here for just a moment. The word elder means defender of the faith. Harold B. Lee said the term elder, which is applied to all holders 
of the Melchizedek priesthood means a defender of the faith. That is our prime responsibility and calling. Every holder of the Melchizedek priesthood is to be a defender of the faith. Conference report, April 1970, page 54. Now, why is that so important to know that? Well, in a general sense, all of us who are uh, ordained elders are defenders. But there are two groups in the church who wear the title. One is general authorities. If a general authority comes to our stake, President Murdoch would introduce him as elder so-and-so of the Quorum of the Twelve or of the Quorum of the Seventy. He would never introduce Elder Holland as Apostle Holland. He'd probably get corrected if he did that. So we use the word elder. So when Elder Holland stands up to speak, what we just said is the defender of the faith stands here today. Make sure you listen to what he says. The other group who wear the title, and they wear it right on their coats, is the full-time missionaries. So when they knock on a door and introduce themselves as elder so-and-so, they are saying to those individuals, a defender of the faith stands at your door. Will you please listen to the message that I have? We need to help especially our young people to understand what that word means, that it means a defender of the faith. It is a very, very special word. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the priesthood offices. Uh, it's fairly difficult or fairly easy, I think, that you can understand most of that. But let's go over here to verse 66. But the presiding elders, traveling bishops, high counselors, and so forth, traveling bishops at this time, uh, eventually uh, there will be two of them, is Edward Partridge and Newell K. Whitney. They are traveling bishops. Later, it won't be till winter quarters that the title presiding bishop will be used for the first time. And Newell K. Whitney will be sustained by that title presiding bishop. But just because it wasn't used till winter quarters doesn't mean that Edward Partridge is not the first presiding bishop. Standing bishops, standing bishops over wards, that doesn't come till the Nauvoo period. And so when you see traveling bishops, in essence, they're general authorities of the church. Standing bishops, that terminology, will come uh, later in the Nauvoo period. So uh, you might want to be aware of that. I'm going to comment just on the sacramental prayers. 75 through 79 deals with the sacrament. I want to share with you, if I might, a statement that comes from uh, President Dallin Oaks, and he gives an interesting observation about those prayers. He said, when the priest offers the scriptural prayer on the bread at the sacrament table, he prays that all who partake may witness unto God the Eternal Father that they're willing to take upon the name of thy son. This witnesses several different meanings. It causes us to renew the covenant we made in the waters of baptism to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ, to serve him to the end. We also take upon us his name as we publicly profess our belief in him, as we fulfill our obligations as members of his church and as we do the work of his kingdom. But there is something beyond these familiar meanings. Because what we witness is not that we take upon us his name, that, uh, but that we are willing to do so. In this sense, our witness relates to some future event or status whose attainment is not self-assumed, but depends on the authority or initiative of the Savior himself. Scriptural references to the name of Jesus Christ often signify the authority of Jesus Christ. In that sense, our willingness to take upon us his name signifies our willingness to take upon us the authority of Jesus Christ in the sacred ordinances of the temple to receive the highest blessings available through his authority when he chooses to confer them upon us. Finally, our willingness to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ affirms our commitment to do all that we can to be counted among those whom he will choose to stand at his right hand, be called by his name at the last day. In this sacred sense, our witness that we're willing to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ constitutes our declaration of candidacy for exaltation 
in the celestial kingdom. And then he concludes by saying this, that is what we should ponder as we partake of the sacred emblems of the sacrament. As we do so, we glory in the mission of the risen Lord who lived and taught and suffered and died and rose again that all mankind might have immortality and eternal life. Of this I testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. That comes from Dallin Oaks, Enzyme, May 1985, page 82 and 83. Enzyme, May 1985, page 82 and 83. And I close tonight again in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we appreciate Brother Stephen sharing his words with us tonight and are grateful for the spirit that has been with us. We ask thee to help us ponder these words that we may gain more understanding and that we may gain the peace that comes from the atonement of Jesus Christ in our repentance. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.